Romans chapter number 8, certainly one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament. A lot of victory in this chapter, a lot of help in this chapter, a lot of excitement in this chapter. Uh, sometimes it's good just sit down and read this chapter, uh, especially when you feel like the devil's parked outside your door. Uh, but I'm interested in just one small section of this great chapter. Uh, let's look in verse number 14. The Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, uh, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, I quote this verse a lot, but it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, my heart was uplifted during it. Amen. Lord, I'm thankful for the greatest of all miracles. That day you saved me. And God, I'm thankful you made me different because things are different now. And God, I'm certainly uh, uh, a candidate to let the hallelujahs roll. I love it when it's shouting time. But God, I'm glad you're a God that never changes. Lord, uh, every day things change in our lives, but God, I'm glad we can always go back to you, the rock of ages that never changes. And God, thank you for always manifesting yourself when we need you most. Now, Father, we thank you for the reading of the word of God. Now, Lord, I pray you'd help me tonight. You know my heart is full. Uh, all that you have showed me, I can't wait to help your people with it because I know uh, this whole world, the sorry devil, and even our flesh will certainly burden us, weigh us down, hinder us, and cause us, Lord, to not be what we should be. So, Father, give us strength, give us grace, open our eyes. Lord, certainly draw us closer to Thee. We pray for Your presence so real and so strong tonight that folks will get help. We certainly pray if there's any amongst us tonight unsaved, lost without God, I pray for a Holy Ghost conviction upon them, that God, we'd see them birthed into the family of God. Use this unworthy vessel now, and Father, we'll bless you and praise you for all that you do. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of thy word, uh, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This is a wonderful chapter. Uh, and this is a wonderful section of this chapter. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, the call uh, of the Holy Spirit, the call of the Spirit of God. Uh, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, uh, they are the sons of God. Uh, Jesus said that no man had come unto the Father except he be drawn. Uh, we were drawn under conviction by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, we were drawn to repentance through the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, but Jesus said when he left uh, that he would not leave us comforter, uh, comfortless, that he must go away, that the comforter would come. Uh, and I'm glad, uh, uh, Brother James, when he saved us, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, and I'm glad, hallelujah, uh, that I never go anywhere that he's not there. Uh, and I'm glad he leads us. Uh, what a blessing for the call of the Spirit. Uh, hey, if you are not being led of the Spirit of God, you don't know God. Uh, hey, I'm glad. Hallelujah. There's times I don't know which way is up, uh, but he'll just begin to speak to my heart uh, and point me in the right direction. Uh, I'm glad he lets me know when I'm not where I should be. Uh, I'm glad he not lets me know uh, uh, when I need help. Help. Uh, I'm glad when I'm reading the Word of God, He'll give me peace. Uh, he'll give me strength. Uh, he'll give me something that'll feed my soul. Uh, I'm glad for the leading of the Spirit of God. Uh, we see the call of the Spirit. I want you to notice, if you will, the companion of the Spirit. Look at verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Just uh, let me say right there. Uh-oh. 
whole lot of people scared to death. It's not God that's making you afraid. Now listen, Brother Phil, I don't know why you're backslidden on the back road night. When you got born again, you received a new nature. You still had this old Adamic nature, the old man, uh, but now you had a brand new man living within you uh, who sealed you, uh, who uh, uh, is there to lead you and guide you and direct you. Uh, now that you have new two natures, the one you feed the most is the strongest. And them folks that are saved and scared to death about all this COVID junk, you're not being led of the Holy Ghost. Can I help you with something? Miss Marcy is saying some pretty, so let me come down here and talk to you. You ain't going to like to hear this, but you're going to die of something. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're going to take your last breath here and wake up in glory. What's so bad about that? Huh? I mean, I... I'd rather have, I guess, COVID than something else that would cause me to die. But one of these days, I'm checking out. Huh? We are. Yeah. I mean, you know, death has never lost a one except Jesus. Mm. Uh, and because death couldn't hold him, it's not going to keep me from going to heaven. Huh? But I'm just trying to help you with something. Everybody's scared to death over this virus. Brother Josh told me this before service. He really pumped me up. Thank you, Brother Josh. Appreciate it. God bless you. He said he read uh, where 500,000 people worldwide every year die of strep. Isn't that what you told me? Strep throat. 500,000 people die of strep throat. Well, bless God, I guess we're going to have to get a mask for, for our throats now. I don't know. I mean, uh, I mean uh, people die every day. 6,500 people die every day of something. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, I'm not afraid of that. God didn't give us the spirit of fear. Uh, why are you letting Satan bind you when this chapter even tells us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But notice what that verse continues to say. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We notice the companion of the Spirit through the Spirit of God. Uh, my dear friends, we are, are part of the family of God. Uh, and we, uh, my dear friends, have the privilege of not uh, only referring to Almighty God, not only referring to Jehovah God, not only referring to the Heavenly Father, uh, but we can call Him our Father. Uh, uh, that term Abba is that intimate and affectionate thing. Uh, uh, Brother Tommy, uh, uh, if I come and I say, Daddy, give me five bucks. You're not going to listen to me. Uh, but when that little curly-headed boy sits on your lap and says, Daddy, uh, he gets your attention. Uh, hey, the devil's children can call on God all, all, all day long. Uh, hey, but if they've got iniquity in their heart, God will not hear them. Uh, but I've got news for you. Uh, it don't matter what uh, hog pen I might find myself in. Uh, it don't matter what uh, shape my life's in. Uh, all i got to do is call and he answers me. Oh, we have the companionship of the Spirit. We see the call of the Spirit. Notice the confirmation of the Spirit. Verse 16. The Bible says the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'm glad uh, He not only saved me, he lets me know he saved me. Uh, hey, hallelujah. Uh, I'm glad that his spirit bears witness with my spirit. Uh, I'm glad, hallelujah. Uh, I, I got that settled a long time ago. Uh, I don't have to worry who I belong to. Uh, hey, Jordan and Christian and Sydney don't have to worry if they're mine. They know they're mine. Uh, they're foster kids. Uh, what a blessing. got a fourth one now. I'll tell you, uh, uh, we got four foster kids. Uh, uh, but I've got news for you. Hallelujah. Uh, I belong to him. Uh, I know his voice. Uh, he knows my name. Uh, what a blessing to have that uh, confirmation. 
I worry about folks when they get into a service when God gets to moving, they sit there like they're bored. When he gets to moving, I want to get to moving. Something gets to happening. Uh, uh, I like it when he starts bearing witness. Mm. And if you struggle with that, all you got to do is ask him. If you belong to him, he'll let you know. Uh, but if God gets to moving and nothing's happening in your life, you might want to do some checking up. Paul said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Well, I'm not preaching on that tonight. Notice, if you will, the crowning of the Spirit. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Brother Clint, for service, you were singing that song, I own a clear title to a mansion. And you do. You're an heir. You know, the angels don't own anything in heaven. You know, the four beasts don't own anything in heaven. But you, my dear friend, uh, are an heir. You own everything Jesus owns. Uh, if that ever lights in on you, uh, that, hey, uh, uh, you're not a pauper. Uh, uh, you're not the austere of the world. Uh, you are of a royal priesthood, uh, of a chosen generation. Uh, hey, the Father of all uh, is your Father. Uh, and when Jesus saved you, uh, he made you a joint heir uh, to everything he has uh, and everything he has you have uh, and hey if that doesn't help you uh, I don't know what will uh, hey Noah got on the ark uh, they called him a crazy man uh, he preached righteousness for 120 years uh, didn't have anybody on there but his family uh, and a bunch of stinking animals uh, but when he stepped off uh, he owned it all uh, hey friend uh, they think we're crazy uh, they say we're not essential. Uh, they don't understand all this. Uh, but hey, when we step off the old ship of Zion uh, onto the streets of glory, uh, we own it all. Hallelujah. I bless his holy name. But then, I want to get to where we live. And all that will stir you up. But what I'm about to say is going to sober you up. Notice the conflicts because of the Spirit. Verse 17 goes on to say, If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time uh, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now neighbor, listen. You've heard me say, Suffering's real. Amen. And we can act like it was a pipe dream, but she had cancer. I like that word had, past tense. Miss Brandy had cancer. Miss Mary had cancer. Brother Jack had cancer. The preacher had cancer. Huh? Do you know what a miracle that is right now? Do you know how many churches I know where people had cancer and died? We had it. We're all still here kicking. Amen. And I want to tell you something. That was reality. And you've heard me say that, neighbor, when we step off into glory, all the sufferings won't even be a memory anymore because of the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that's a wonderful thought, Brother Bob. You're not going to have a pacemaker in your chest when you get to heaven. Ain't that wonderful? You want, you know, and you want that might be your last checkup. We might just go on to glory after this revival. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes, sir. Yeah, huh? How do you get a glorified body just like His? Be wonderful, and that's wonderful. Think about that stuff, Brother Daryl. No more pain, no more sickness, no more heartache, and all that. It's going to be wonderful. But that's thin. That's the sweet by and by. Now we live in the nasty now. Now. You do have a pacemaker. There is a real virus running around. Cancer is real. They don't have a cure for it. Huh? There's all kinds of things that we're faced with. It seems as if most of the Christian life is a constant struggle. Can I say that Peter said we'd have trials? 
In 1 Peter 1, verse 6, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. That's what happened in revival. We greatly rejoiced, but just for a season. Because now life's hit us. And then it goes on to say, if need be. Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter said we'd have trials. Our faith would be trialed, tried. Can I say trials come to prove us? Not to God. God knows what you made of. If he knows the number of the hairs on your head, sorry, Brother Brian. He knows you. He knows the intents of your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows your down sitting, uprising. He knew you before you ever was. God knows you. He doesn't allow trials to come into our life so he can see what you're made of. He knows you. He knows your deceitful heart. You don't, but he does. Trials come to prove us, number one, to ourselves. How many times have you said, Lord, I can't go any farther only to find you can't go farther? Lord, I can't take any more only to find you can't take more. Trials come to prove you to you, but trials also come to prove to this world what you have is real. A faith that isn't tested is worthless. We do face trials. Paul had a thorn. Trials come to prove us, but Paul had a thorn. 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 12, verse number 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Paul said God had shown me so much. We know he had wrote half the New Testament. I mean, Paul walked with God like uh, uh, very few men ever have. Uh, uh, and Paul, lest he be lifted up with pride in all that God showed him, God, he went on to say this. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Trials prove us. Thorns cause pain. Now I'm here to tell you, pain's a four-letter word. Pain in every instance of the definition hurts. Now, it's amazing God made some with a higher pain tolerance than others. And he knows just how much pain you can handle and how much pain he can dump on you. But make no mistake, nobody ever gets up unless you're some kind of masochist and say, Lord, sign me up for that pain line today. No, we pray God sign me up for that blessing line today. We well, don't like pain. Pain hurts. And that's what thorns does. It causes pain. Peter said there'd be trials. Paul had a thorn. Jesus said we'd suffer tribulation. He said in John 16, 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Tribulation like thorns isn't something you sign up for. Thorns cause pain, but tribulation can cause panic. When tribulation comes into your life, you can get a big case of the can't helps and not for good. You can panic. So it seems like most of our Christian life we're facing trials, thorns, or tribulation. Matter of fact, it's almost scary sometimes to be on a mountaintop for any time because you know there's a valley coming. Huh? Brother Greg and I was talking while the last meeting's going on that God had been so good around here, but we know what happens afterwards. What some of you have experienced since. The devil shows up. I want to preach with God's help for just a little while tonight. Paul said in chapter 8 if so be that we suffer with him I'm going to preach on this thought 
Why do God's people suffer? Boy, when you first get saved, and all you know is the love of God and the peace of God and the joy that God gives you from delivering you from salvation. It's so wonderful, and it's still wonderful, can I say, 46 years later? But somewhere after that honeymoon of salvation, suffering comes. Why do we suffer? I mean, I thought everything was going to be wonderful. That's because you don't know the scriptures. Jesus said, or I'm sorry, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So why do we suffer? I mean, if God's a God of love, and He is, and if God has grace and abundant supply, and He does, and if God is merciful, and He is, and if God is long-suffering, and He is, and if God is great, and He is, and if God, everything about Him is so wonderful, and it is, why do sometimes we feel like He's forgotten all about us? And the floodgates of adversity overwhelm us. Why do we suffer? Why do you have suffering? But why do? You do, don't you? You're breathing, aren't you? Hmm? You read the Tozer book, tore you inside out. And ever since then, the devil's been trying to tear you upside down. Hmm? We suffer. Sometimes it's physical pain. Sometimes it's mental torment. Sometimes it's just being anxious, having to deal with getting everything done. But you do suffer. So why do we suffer? Why would God allow his children to suffer? Any parent worth their salt in here tonight would take abuse so your child don't have to. I've got news for you. Jesus did on Calvary. So you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. But why do we suffer? You know, the hardest thing on a, on a parent is to watch their children have to go through things that you can't help them. Right. Yeah. So why does God allow us thorns and trials and tribulation? Well, can I say, first of all, sufferings come to empty us. To empty us. The Bible says, Be ye filled with the Spirit of God. How can we be, be filled with the Spirit when we're full of other things? In order to empty us, sometimes God has to cause us to suffer. Can I say this? What do we need to be emptied of? Well, sometimes of distractions. Hmm. Uh, I forget which Disney movie it was, but there was a Disney movie. It had a goofy dog on it. And all of a sudden, the dog's doing something. Squirrel runs by. Squirrel! Lost all faculty of what he was supposed to do because it got scent of the squirrel. That's just like us. We know that we're to walk after the Spirit. We know we're to read the Bible. We know we're to pray. We know we're to be a witness. And we're striving to do all that. We're running well. And all of a sudden, a spiritual squirrel comes across us. And we get distracted. It's one thing if the world's distracted because the world don't know God. But it has amazed me of how many even preachers during this COVID, all they got their mind on is COVID. You know what helped COVID? Get your mind on Christ. Hmm? And sometimes we get distracted and God's got to bring something into our lives that causes us to get back to where we should have been all along. And that's focused on Christ sometimes he has to empty us of our demeanor there's a little five letter word that God hates it's called pride and sometimes we allow pride to keep us from being where Christ would have us be well, I went to the altar last night I'm not going back tonight that's dangerous you might be asking for a little tribulation What's our rule? 
mind the Lord. If he says go to the altar four times in the service, go to the altar four times and just do what he says. Sometimes our demeanor causes us. Your altitude will be no higher than your attitude. And sometimes we get to burn our saddle. Sometimes we get sideways with God or God's people or God's man. And we get all this going on. And God's not in first place in our heart and life. And so we must suffer. We've got to be empty to that. And by the way, Brother Donald, it's a whole lot better if you humble yourself than God humble you. Because when he humbles you, he don't stop till the job gets done. And he does know how to break each and every one of us. He knows that thing that it takes to break us. Can I say this? Sometimes he has to empty us of our dependence, our attachments, those things we depend on more than we depend on him. Some people depend on the news. God help you. Do you know through all this, I've quit watching. I, I know you've heard me say this. I've quit watching. I didn't watch any of the other garbage, but I'd watch Fox News. I'd watch Tucker, and I'd watch Sean, and I'd watch Laura. I quit watching them because they have talking points too. I quit watching the local news. I mean, they don't give me enough sports to watch it anyway. Used to be big into sports. And then the weatherman always lied to me. So why watch it? And you know what I have found? Life is so much more happy when I'm not being pumped full with a bunch of lies that caused me to have to search them out and get mad that I was lied to. Uh huh? But see, if you're not careful, and that's what happens, we don't realize how dependent we become on things. So many things we're dependent on to get us through our day when aren't we supposed to depend on Him? Mm -mm. You see, sometimes sufferings come to empty us so that our demeanor will be Christ-like, so our dependence will be on Christ, and so that we won't be distracted that everything is about Christ. Then and only then are we really Christian. Uh, one writer said it this way. He said, it's not what God is doing to you, but it's what he's doing in you. And suffering comes, it's not about what he's doing to you, it's what he is doing in you that makes the suffering worthwhile. That's why the suffering of this present time will not be worthy or is not worthy due to what will be revealed, the glory which shall be revealed in us when we get to heaven. Amen. When you see what he did in you, you'll say, hallelujah. I didn't know God was doing that. Uh, can I help you with this? I'll use this old analogy. I, I've used this before, but I, it just come to mind I'm going to use it. There's a young man that wanted to play football. His dad had a farm. You can identify that. He had to work on the farm. Had chores on the farm. And dad told him, well, we've got you know, all this work on the farm that needs to be done. But the boy really wanted to play football. And dad told him, right off the steps in the front yard going to the old farmhouse was a big old boulder. And his dad told him, he says, I'll tell you what, you got all summer. If you can move that boulder by fall, then I'll let you play football. So every day after that boy got his chores done, he'd be out there trying to wrestle that big old boulder. And that become reality because Miss Annette wanted a big old boulder for, for Mother's Day. And the kids got her a boulder, and the guy slid it off a dump truck, and he put it in the wrong place. You should have seen Jordan manhandling that boulder. I mean, Jordan, he's strong as Knox. He'd pick up that piano like a cheeseburger. He's strong. He was out there wrestling with that rock, but he did move the rocks, what I'm saying. But it wasn't as big as this one this boy's was having to wrestle with. It's coming up on fall, Trev. The boy comes in for dinner. He's all dejected. His dad said, what's wrong, boy? He said, Dad, I'm not going to get to play football. He said, why? He said, I can't move that rock. He said, boy, get down and give me 50 push-ups. The boy, get down. Woo, woo, woo. Whipped him out. 
He said, give me 50 sit-ups. Woo, woo, woo. And Dad said, you can play football, boy. He said, he said, all the while, while you was trying to work on that rock, that rock was working on you. And you see, all the while, Amen. while you think this suffering is working on the outside, it's really doing something on the inside. And it's building you up for the cause of Christ. Sometimes suffering comes to empty us. Can I say this secondly? Sometimes suffering comes to enlighten us. To show us where the Spirit is leading. To direct us in the paths of righteousness. And to cause us to walk on that straight way called holiness. Can I say God a lot of times is trying to open our eyes to some things. You see we get so tunnel vision thinking this is what it's all about. That we lose scope, there's a whole big world out here that God wants to win. And the reason that God saved us is not so we can come into church and shout and enjoy one another's company. He saved us to be a light to the world that the world would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And sometimes we lose sight of all that and God has to open our eyes to what and, and give us true perspective of what this thing's all about. Well, I read this quote, I kind of liked it. You see, when you're suffering and you're going through things, you don't understand things. But this writer said this, he said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain. You see, sometimes we've got to go through something so God's voice becomes so loud in our life that we wake up and we realize what God's trying to do in our lives. See, sometimes God causes us to suffer, Thad, and I don't know why you've got MS, but God's got a reason. And God uses everything that he puts in our life to better us for his kingdom. Can I say this? Sometimes sufferings come not only to empty us or enlighten us, but sometimes they come to edify us. That word edify means to build up or to develop us or to grow us. You see, what happens, it seems like, Miss Mary, in Christians' lives, we first get saved, we can't get enough of God. We can't get enough church, we can't get enough of the Bible, can't get enough. But we get to a point where we just kind of sit down on God and we just quit learning. Oh, we come to, we come to preach him, we come to Sunday school, we, we hear to teach him, we hear it, but we just quit growing. So God sends suffering to build us up so we can grow more, so we can go farther, so we can do more. And can I say, A.W. Tozer, who wrote that book that Brother Clint got all tore up about, said this, It is doubtful that God will use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Sometimes in order for God to greatly use us, he has to wound us. And sometimes that wounding hurts. Everybody knows Jacob was the schemer until he wrestled with God. Then he became Israel. The world was changed because of Israel. But what people fail to realize is Israel lived the rest of his life with a limp because he wrestled with God. Hmm? My dear friend, sometimes he does it to edify us. Sometimes sufferings come to engage us. We get disconnected. Or we just get to where we're going through the motions. We get complacent. And God will once again desire our fellowship so much he'll send suffering into our lives to reconnect us with him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, after Paul mentioned he had a thorn in the flesh, and boy, that knocked a lot of Baptists out right there. Oh, no, I don't want to hurt. Listen to what Paul said about that messenger of Satan to buffet him, that thorn. When he realized it drew him closer to God because he prayed more, he sought God more, and he hungered and thirsted for God more, he said this in verse number 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and uh, distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Sounds like he got a little perspective over that thorn, does he not? Hmm? Because he got re-engaged. And therefore, God got glory from his life. Now, y'all aren't being spiritual, so let me use something worldly on you right now. Huh? How many have seen, if you haven't seen it, you are living in a box. How many have seen the movie Top Gun? Three of us. Y'all lying in church. Huh? I've seen every Tom Cruise movie up to about 2,000. Because Miss Annette thought he had the prettiest smile. Yeah. <laughs> seen them all. Uh, I'm just glad Top Gun came out after I got out of high school. I'd have signed up. Give me a jet. Let me at it. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Huh? Let me have it. Huh? What happens? He's, he's mourning over the loss of Goose. Now it's time to cry, Miss Sonny. Goose died. It's bad. You know? Hey, by the way, Top Gun 2 was supposed to come out and COVID knocked it out. Huh? Maverick's going to train Goose's boy. Top Gun 2. Sign me up. We'll go see it. All right? But listen. Goose died. Maverick's having a hard time flying without Goose. Goose was his buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't have the possums without the possums. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be there to be the backup, to be the helper of Iceman who's taken on the Russian MiGs. And without Goose, he just loses it. He pulls out. Leaves Iceman all alone to fight all these sorry, no good Russians who later would try to throw the election. That wasn't in. You've got to read the footnotes. <laughs> but something happens, and the guys running control said, Maverick's engaging. What happened? He got over the fact Goose was getting gone, and he didn't want Iceman to go down. Well, sometimes we get hurt. Sometimes we lose folks. Sometimes we, f we, we face great things. And we've got to make up our mind whether we're going to be engaged with God or just spiral out of control without Him. And sometimes God sends exactly what we need so we'll get reengaged. Hmm? So we'll get back to being what we should be. And by the way, we are fitly framed together. And we do need each other. We depend on the Lord, but we do need each other. And sometimes well, I, I have to bear your burden. If I'm not in my spot, I can't bear your burden. Sometimes you have to bear my burden. If you're not in your place, you can't bear my burden. Uh, and when we're not bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ, uh, the devil wins. So God knows how to send suffering. So we'll depend on Him and certainly be there for each other. I thought about this. Sometimes God sends suffering to enrich us. Can I say this? Desperation brings enrichment. You won't appreciate a good cup of water till you have no water. You won't appreciate your health till your health's gone. Preached a message one time on you won't miss the water till the well runs dry. And sometimes God sends suffering so we appreciate the water. So we appreciate the health. So we appreciate the goodness of God and the blessings of God and the benefits of God. We appreciate that we do have feet we can walk, uh, hands that can raise, uh, roof over our house, uh, food on our table, uh, a little change in our pocket, uh, gasoline in the tank, uh, a job to work, uh, a good church to come to. Uh, hey, sometimes he sends suffering to enrich us. 2 Timothy 4. Verse 16, Paul said this, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Ever been there? Yep. And you feel all alone? Feel like nobody cares? Feel like everybody's talking about you like a dog? 
You ever been there? Well, wear my shoes for a little bit. You can, you'll get there real quick, all right? But he goes on to say this in verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Huh? See, sometimes he allows suffering to come to where we think that we're, we're in this thing alone. We're, we're fighting under the devil and the world and, and, the, and the flesh and we only got two hands, we need three and, and it feels like you know everything in the world's against us and nobody cares just so that he can walk in and he can show up and he can prove that he cares and it enriches us. I want you to write this down. I want you to remember this phrase. The phrase is this, for this cause, I have Jesus. If you'd have had that phrase when cancer came knocking, for this cause, I have Jesus. My dear friends, when the boss man says you are no longer needed, for this cause, I have Jesus. When your family refuses to come to church with you, for this cause, I have Jesus. When they talk about you like your dog, for this cause, I have Jesus. When sickness comes, when trials comes, when thorns comes, when problems come, when everything comes against you, for this cause, uh, I have Jesus. Uh, because without Jesus, you could make it. Uh, without Jesus, you'd have no hope. Uh, without Jesus, there'd be no victory. Uh, without Jesus, there'd be no peace. Uh, without Jesus, there'd be no comfort. Uh, uh, but hey, uh, for this cause, uh, I have Jesus. Uh, and if I have him, uh, I have all I need and I have everything and for this cause it is worth it because I have Jesus now can I say this in closing sufferings may befall us and they will but they will not overcome us the psalmist wrote in Psalms 34 19 many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Jesus has never lost a one. And he's not going to lose you. For this cause, I have Jesus. We're getting ready to go into a revival meeting. And I want to tell you something. Y'all know the Harris family. Not only can them boys sing, but Brother Jerry can preach. They'll be here Lord willing Sunday. Most of you don't know Brother Cody. Brother Cody's going to be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Powerful, powerful, gifted man of God. You're going to enjoy. Brother Greg said it this way. He said, your people are going to go ape over him. That's what Brother Greg said. You don't know Cody, but you know a lot of people who have used Cody. Brother Greg uses Cody at their church. Brother Sidney, when he was pastored, used Cody. He'd have me and Cody come preach revival for him. Uh, uh, he, 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 Cody's well known throughout the South, and I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. And then Brother Daniel's coming back on Thursday and Friday. I mean, God wants to do something next week big time but some of you have been hitting with adversity and God gave me this little thought for tonight so you can get some perspective now look at whatever it is and say for this cause I have Jesus because next week is coming and Jesus has brought you to this point so you can have next week and whatever you face to get you to next week, it's going to be worth it when the glory is revealed. Are you listening? Amen. For this cause I have Jesus. So that now that you have Jesus, are you ready to go on? Amen. Are you ready for what he has in store? Because Jesus never does anything halfway. You know, he does press down, shaking, bubbling over. You understand? Aren't you about ready for what he has for you? Hey, now that you realize why you've had to face what you're facing, uh, why you're going through what you're going through, for this cause I have Jesus! Uh, and look out next week, because uh, you might get more of him than you can stand. Uh, so I wonder tonight, now that you know why God's people suffer, are you willing to come and thank him? That he cares enough about you not to leave you when the sufferings come. And why he allows the suffering to come so he draws you closer to him. Are you willing to come and say, Father, I want all of you that I can have. Are you willing to do that tonight? Are you willing to lay it down at his feet? 
Are you willing to humble yourself and say, Lord, thank you for the sufferings that I might know your blessings? Tonight, he wants to do so much in your life. And he hasn't allowed this to come to hurt you. He's allowed this to come to strengthen you for what lies ahead. Are you willing to give it to Jesus? Let's all stand. Miss Renee, you come. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. And while they're coming to get a song, and folks are coming to pray, let's pray. Father, we do love you. Lord, suffering is never easy. That's why it's called suffering. But it's manageable because I have Jesus. So, Father, the next time when adversity befalls us, help us to remember for this cause I have Jesus. Lord, help us to yield all to Thee so that, Lord, You don't have to strip anything from us. Now, Father, get glory now in this invitation. Help your people. Many have been hurting. Help them, God. Give them that balm of Gilead. And then, God, if there's somebody amongst us unsaved, I pray the night would be the night that they'd surrender to Jesus and give Him their heart and life. Now, God, bless. Help folks in this invitation. And, Father, we'll bless you and praise you for what you do. Thank you for your goodness now. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.